You can support In the Past Lane by buying some of our merchandise. We've got merch with quotations from famous people in history, like George Orwell, who said, The most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. And we've got some snarky ones, too, like one of our bestsellers that says, Historians Against History Repeating Itself. And this one has many variations, like Archivists Against History Repeating Itself, also History Majors, History Teachers, A-Push Students, and more. You can get these designs and many more on everything from a t-shirt or a hoodie to a water bottle or a baby onesie. Just go to our website, inthepastlane.com, and click on Merchandise. Thanks. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. And the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Hi there. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. Brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and coming to you from the Richter Scale Studios located in central Massachusetts. I'm your host, historian at large, Edward T. O'Donnell, and this is episode 189. Every week here at In the Past Lane, I tell you what happened in U.S. history this week with special attention to one important story. So what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, I'm continuing to hunger down in my home during this coronavirus crisis. My teaching via Zoom is going well. And my puppy is thrilled to have two humans at home all the time. And like many of you, I'm doing a lot more cooking, which for me is a lot of fun because I've always loved cooking. I've discovered the magic of short, uncomplicated recipes from the New York Times. It's amazing what one can whip up in less than an hour using everyday ingredients and a sheet pan. Anyway, our time of isolation is going well, and everyone in my family is safe and healthy. I hope that's the case for you and yours. All right, let's get on with it. Here's what happened this week in American history. Let's start with this. On April 18th, 1906, at 5.13 a.m., the city of San Francisco was shaken by a tremendous earthquake. Later estimated as measuring 7.9 on the Richter scale, it lasted 72 seconds, heaving streets up and down, opening and closing huge chasms, and shaking buildings big and small into piles of rubble. The city's 200,000 residents tumbled out of bed and into the streets in panicked confusion to survey the damage and to find friends and family. The destruction was extensive, and already dozens, maybe even hundreds, had been killed. Few knew it at the time, but this was only the beginning of a larger, rapidly unfolding disaster. For fires had broken out everywhere, and the city's water mains had been ruptured. To make matters worse, the city lost its chief engineer of the fire department, Daniel T. Sullivan. He was crushed to death when a hotel collapsed on the fire department headquarters where he was sleeping. Sullivan was pulled from the wreckage, but he never recovered and died four days later. The significance of the loss of Fire Chief Sullivan was lost on no one. With fires spreading rapidly throughout the city, the fire department desperately needed his experienced leadership. Instead, they would have to rely on his replacement, a man named John Doherty. One inescapable irony regarding Sullivan's death was that he had spent much of his 13 years as fire chief engaged in a futile crusade to get city officials to improve fire safety and preparedness. Just six months earlier, the National Board of Fire Underwriters issued a scathing report on the state of affairs in San Francisco. The refusal of city officials to fund Chief Sullivan's requests for an improved water system and the establishment of an explosives team to blow up buildings in the path of a big fire had left the city flirting with disaster. San Francisco has violated all underwriting traditions and precedents by not burning up, asserted the report. That it has not already done so is largely due to the vigilance of the fire department, which cannot be relied upon to stave off the inevitable. Now the inevitable was upon them, and the city's most knowledgeable fireman lay on his deathbed. The earthquake not only destroyed the city's water system, but also its telephone, telegraph, and fire alarm systems. Fires broke out everywhere, started by overturned lamps and coal stoves, and fed by ruptured gas lines and winds off the Pacific Ocean. That 90% of the city's housing was of wood frame construction only added to the disaster. Fire crews raced to extinguish the fires but everywhere they found the same terrifying result. Not a drop of water was to be had from the hydrants, the fire department report would later state. For a while, they pumped water from tanks, pools, and even sewers, but these sources eventually went dry. Unable to fight the flames, firemen concentrated on pulling victims from collapsed buildings before the flames could reach them. Thousands of terrified people looked on in horror as the inferno grew still larger and the city shook with aftershocks. 
Acting Fire Chief John Doherty soon decided to use explosives to stop the fire, using munitions gathered from local U.S. Army forts. If they could demolish a line of buildings, he reasoned, they might be able to contain the fire and save much of the city. And here's where a compelling story within the story emerged, one driven by anti-Chinese racism. While diverting scarce water to wealthy white sections of the city, the mayor and acting fire chief chose to deploy the explosives in the city's Chinatown. Scores of buildings were destroyed, but the explosions actually accelerated the fires. Within a day, all of Chinatown had been reduced to smoldering rubble and ash. This outcome was devastating to the 15,000 Chinese and Chinese-American residents of the neighborhood, but it was seen as a godsend by the city's powerful business and political elites. We'll circle back to this point in a moment, but for now, let's return to the larger story of the disaster. At 3 p.m., about 10 hours after the earthquake struck, and as reports of looting mounted, Mayor Eugene Schmitz issued a shoot-to-kill proclamation, warning the populace that policemen and soldiers would show no mercy for anyone even suspected of looting. And that proved true, as dozens of people were shot or bayoneted to death, many of them innocent people trying to retrieve their own property. One Chinese-American man went to his apartment to retrieve his birth certificate, a document vital to Chinese-Americans fearful of deportation, and was bayoneted by a soldier. Miraculously, he survived the assault. It took three days and three nights to bring the inferno under control. By then, one quarter of San Francisco had burned, some 498 blocks, leaving 28,000 buildings destroyed. The human toll was originally put at about 700 deaths, but this was pure fiction. It reflected a desperate attempt by city officials to diminish the disaster in the public's mind as a way to preserve the commercial future of the city. More extensive research in recent years has raised the death toll to 3,000, making the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 one of the deadliest disasters in U.S. history. It was also one of the most expensive, costing at least $500 million in 1906 dollars. Now would be a good time to pick up the story within the story about the fate of Chinatown and its 15,000 residents. We know that the political and business leaders of San Francisco saw the destruction of Chinatown as a silver lining in the disaster because they said as much. Chinatown occupied 15 blocks of prime downtown real estate, and for years the city's business and political leaders had talked of evicting the residents and turning it into a business district. In 1904, two years before the earthquake, the city's mayor, James Phelan, had paid the famed architect Daniel Burnham, the guy who planned the Chicago World's Fair of 1893 in the White City, to draw up a master plan for a newly redesigned San Francisco. And the plan's most striking feature? Chinatown was gone. Burnham somehow made it disappear. And the city's business community loved the idea. Here's the headline from the city's Merchants Association Review from February 1905, 14 months before the earthquake. San Francisco may be freed from the standing menace of Chinatown. Plans have been arranged and a corporation formed to turn the Chinese quarter into a business section and to build a new oriental city on Bay Shore. That last part was important. Chinatown would be moved to a remote edge of the city. The justification for this plan was that Chinatown was a horrid cancer on the city, a place filled with opium dens, prostitution, and illegal gambling. White Americans had long come to see Chinatowns in U.S. cities in this light. Stories in the popular press and dime novels, and even early versions of sensational walking tours led by white guides, perpetuated the notion of Chinatowns as immoral spaces, where vice and sin proliferated and an alien, unassimilable culture thrived. In the immediate aftermath of the quake, Mayor Schmitz moved quickly to put into action the plan to get rid of Chinatown. He created a committee of powerful businessmen and political figures to oversee relief efforts and to put into action the Chinatown removal plan. And he made former mayor, James Phelan, the committee's chairman. Phelan, you will remember, is the guy who commissioned the plans for a revamped San Francisco that called for the removal of Chinatown. But then, something extraordinary happened. The residents of Chinatown despite the long odds they faced as a despised and disenfranchised minority group, got organized and took action to stop the plan. Those who owned their building lots in Chinatown started rebuilding immediately. Community leaders hired lawyers and protested before city officials. Here's what one of them, a minister named Reverend Guy Gam, said. Why should the Chinese be isolated any more than the people of Tar Flat? Why should they be singled out? The mayor has no power to isolate the Chinese. Chinatown should go back where it was. That would be nothing but justice. 
We are objecting to the removal of Chinatown on the grounds that it is the Chinese right to remain where they own land. Residents of Chinatown also got in touch with the government of China. And soon, Chinese diplomatic officials were lodging formal complaints with the federal government in Washington, the governor of California, and city officials in San Francisco. And those officials listened, because even back then, China was a significant trading partner with the U.S. And the final and most important card the Chinatown residents played was this. They told San Francisco officials that if the city went forward with plans to move Chinatown to the outskirts of the city, they would relocate en masse to another city, like Los Angeles or Seattle, and take their businesses with them. This was a significant threat, as Chinese and Chinese-American businesses constituted a major part of the city's economy. And all this resistance to anti-Chinese racism? It worked. Less than a month after the earthquake, the city dropped the plan to eliminate Chinatown from downtown San Francisco. Chinatown was rebuilt, along with the rest of the city. And this new Chinatown came with a distinct architectural style, one that would be replicated in Chinatowns all across the United States. The merchants hired white architects, who designed the district to look like what white Americans imagined China looked like. Buildings festooned with brightly colored pagoda-style roofs and carvings of dragons. The idea was to attract tourists, and to promote a new image of Chinatown as a clean and wholesome place. It bore no resemblance to China, but the tourists loved it. And there was one more legacy of the earthquake that affected the city's Chinese and Chinese-American population. The fires destroyed City Hall and virtually all vital records like birth certificates. This allowed Chinese immigrants to claim U.S. birth, and there was no way city officials could prove they were not. This new status allowed them to avoid deportation and to bring relatives from China to join them. Over time, the city of San Francisco made a full recovery from the disaster. And as the city was rebuilt, many of Chief Sullivan's ideas for greater fire safety were implemented, as were tougher building codes to make structures better able to withstand the next earthquake. That day came on October 17, 1989, when an earthquake measuring 7.1 on the Richter scale shook the city. Damage was extensive, but the death toll was far smaller compared to 1906, with 62 fatalities. So what else happened this week in U.S. history? April 14th, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. by Confederate loyalist John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln lingered on the edge of death through the night, and he died the following morning on April 15th. April 15th, 1912, the unsinkable luxury ocean liner Titanic sank at 2.27 a.m. Of the 2,224 passengers and crew aboard, More than 1,500 died in the freezing waters of the North Atlantic. April 19th, 1775, American colonists clashed with British troops in the Battle of Lexington and Concord. This shot heard around the world announced the start of the American War for Independence. And what notable people were born this week? Well, April 13th, 1743, President Thomas Jefferson. April 13th, 1899, Alfred Butts, the inventor of the game Scrabble. April 13th, 1919, renowned atheism promoter Madeleine Murray O'Hare. April 14th, 1840, art collector Isabella Stewart Gardner. April 15th, 1889, labor and civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph. And April 18th, 1857, attorney Clarence Darrow. Okay, time for the last word. Let's give it to Clarence Darrow, who was born 163 years ago this week. He made a career out of defending people in what appeared to be hopeless cases many of them involving civil rights. Here's how he explained his motivation. You can only protect your liberties in this world by protecting the other man's freedom. You can only be free if I am free. Well, that's going to do it for In the Past Lane this week. You can learn more about me and everything we talked about at InThePassLane.com. And let's interact via social media. I'm at In The Past Lane on both Twitter and Instagram, and our Facebook page is In The Past Lane Podcast. See you next week. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 